regarding my personal uh, situation, whether I have been viol subjected to violations or not, my answer is clear, yes. <laughs> how? The question is how? Yes. I, I was arrested and sent to prison. I was held in prison for almost one year back in 2012. I won I joined the Human Rights Association in 2005 while I was a university student. I was it was my last year in the university and I joined the Human Rights Association, the Human Rights Movement and I attended several meetings. I broadened my horizon and I demand such rights not only for me as a person for my community per se but for the whole society. So I joined human rights activities and I make such demands, such public demands. And back in 2012, it was a period of massive arrest under the name of KCK, which is the alleged urban wing of the PKK. And I, together with 71 activists from the trade union movement, from other human rights organizations, from the trade union movement mainly, and human rights defenders, I was arrested for my human rights activities. When I say human rights activities, I am referring to a training that I conducted for the trade unions because it was shown as the evidence for my arrest. And I was arrested back in 2012. It was a period of massive arrest under the name of this KCK, as I said. Then I was held in prison for one year. At that time, I had my daughter was two and a half years old, and I didn't see her one year. And I had to see her, I mean, I had a chance to see her only one hour per month, and I had 10 minutes phone call every week. And as you can imagine, it is too difficult and it is too much for a girl, huh? for such a young baby. And it was too difficult because I had no connections with any violent uh, organizations. I had nothing with violence. I was subjected to this court case. And for your information, the court case is still active. It's still pending. And my argument is, if I'm a terrorist, how come a terrorist is free for six years? Because I was released uh, as part of this pretrial detention period. After this pretrial detention period, I was released. And if I'm a terrorist, how come I can walk for six years in this country? And how come I can still be there? We were not criminals at that time. I'm not a criminal even today, and I will not be a criminal in the future because there is a line, thin line, even though it's a thin line, there is a line between being a oppositional figure and being an illegal figure. I am an oppositional figure to such policies, that's for sure, because we as human rights defenders are working and struggling for rights for everyone, irrespective of their background, ethnic or religious background or political ideas, etc. So I personally was subjected to imprisonment. It was a cell with three people. Uh, one, I had to stay with two more people for one year, had no chance to see anyone else except for my lawyers for one year. And I had to stop my PhD education at that time for one year. I lost one year from my PhD education. I was teaching at the faculty and I couldn't teach for one year and I had to stop my human rights activities, my human rights struggle for one year. That is very, very important in my personal life as well. Then in addition to this imprisonment, I was dismissed from the university from my public service because I was an academic. I was teaching contemporary British poetry and I was teaching cultural study cultural studies courses. And I was dismissed for signing the peace petition which is a petition, which is a document, statement, which demands peace from the government, from the public authorities. As a citizen, I have this right. As a human rights defender, I have this right. But I was dismissed. Now I have no salary. There is no social security. I am under travel ban because I have no passport any longer. 
like all other dismissed public officers. Because if you are dismissed, then you lose your passport. Your passport is cancelled as well. And we have no chance to work in the public sector and even in the private sector. So I'm not talking about my case only. There are more than 100,000 public officers who are under these conditions. We were dismissed from the universities with no judicial investigation, with no due process. We just saw our names on the list and then we are out of the public service. And with regard to the imprisonment period, I have to add that. And I need to clarify that. I was not the only human rights defender in prison at that time. We were 19 human rights defenders from my organization only in prison. And there, are, there were more than 50 human rights association members who were being subjected to judicial harassment at that time. So my colleagues had to stay in prison more than two years, three years periods. So it was part of the orchestrated policies of criminalization of women rights defenders, defamation of women rights defenders at that time. As for the dismissals, it is the same. We were criminalized. We were labeled as terrorists. And we have family, families. We have colleagues. Now, some of them do not want to talk to us because it is not easy if you are labeled as a terrorist for having steel connections and social relations in Turkey, especially under such conditions, especially in a polarized society. So I personally, yes, regarding your question, I personally was subjected to some violations, namely the imprisonment and also dismissals. Whether I have thought about stopping my activities for human rights, my answer is again very clear and short, no. Because let me begin with a personal story. And again, as you can imagine, it is not the only. unique story for me. Huh? It's, it's not the only story. I was in prison and my daughter was talking, was talking to me over the phone and she said that if you were home, there would be no nightmare for me. And I couldn't make it. And it was really, I mean, it was the hardest night that I had in my life. Because my daughter had nightmares and I couldn't make it. It was really difficult. But the human rights situation for human rights defenders in this country has never been perfect in this country. Because we are not the human rights defenders only, we are the victims of these human rights policies and practices as well. I mean, in my personal life, my father was in prison. My grandfather was in prison for their position. So I was a kid and I was aware of such policies and I was subjected to these issues. So when I joined the human rights movement as a, as a university student, I was aware of the fact that there would be such pressures and judicial harassments or even physical attacks, etc. Because in my organization, in the Human Rights Association, we have 27 colleagues who were killed by unknown forces. So it's a fact. And we had several colleagues, numerous colleagues, who were in prison, who had to leave this country. So, for example, my predecessor, the former General Secretary of the Human Rights Association, my dear colleague, Mr. Hassan Annar, is in Switzerland now as a refugee, as an asylum seeker. So it, was, it is not something new to us. We were aware of it. But I didn't think stop such activities. I didn't think about stopping such activities because these activities are important for me as a person to fulfill my responsibilities and it makes contributions to the solution in this country. That is true. 
I may not see a solution in my personal life, but that is the only way to make contributions to the solution. That is the only way to reach a solution in this country. I personally may not see it, okay, but the future generations, for example, my daughter, I also have a son now, so my kids will be able to see it. And if I don't struggle, then there will be no chance. At, of course, there might be still chances, but there will be no chance to make contributions to such solutions from our side. Because we are human beings. Of course, having a job is important. Having living standards are important, but having dignity and honor is the key issue for a personal life, for a person. If you have no honor, if you have no dignity in your life, it doesn't mean whether you live in your country or somewhere else. So I didn't stop it. And I began with the story of my daughter, how she explained her situation, what I did after her uh, story. I told her that I was working there and it will be over, of course, for sure. And when I was released, right after the mm, release, I took her and we went to the Human Rights Association office on the following day. And I explained to her that this is the new office for me. And then I took her to the university again and I said, this is the other office that I'm working. So I took her and introduced what I'm doing in a better way. So she, of course, it was not a full consolation for her. She doesn't feel comfortable still, but she is aware of the fact that I am trying to do something good for me, for her, for my family, for my community, for my country, because this is my country. This is my society. If there is a problem, we as the citizens of this country are the main responsible citizens to raise our concerns, to struggle or to make contributions for a potential solution. Regarding what should be done, what can be done to improve the human rights situation in, in Turkey and the role of civil society and the authorities play. It is from our perspective, if human rights principles, democratic principles are internalized by the authorities, then it will be super easy to reach a solution. Because if they internalize such principles, that means they will make changes in the legislation from the human rights perspective. It will be a legislation which respects human rights principles. That is perfect. Then there will be public officers who will work in their public services from the human rights perspective. That means they will respect for the rights for example, they will provide the same service to anyone, irrespective of their ethnic background, religious background, or other difference. Like if there is an LGBTI person, a citizen who needs to get service, there will be no discrimination if human rights principles are internalized and if public authorities respect such principles. Or it's the same for a disabled citizen. It's the same for a Kurdish citizen, Armenians, for a non-believer, for Christians. So this is very important for the public authorities. They have to respect human rights principles and values, democratic values. According to the addition, option, additional protocol number 15 of the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 1 of this protocol says, the main responsibility goes to the public authorities, goes to the government with regard to the human right, implementation of human rights principles. So this is the first part. As regard to the civil society's role, we have this role of being a third eye. So we need to watch, we need to monitor and observe what is happening. And if there is any problem, if there is any area which needs to be improved, then we need to raise our concerns 
for example, it might be about freedom of expression. If there is any public officer, a security officer, a governor who does not act in line with the freedom of expression principles, for example, then we can raise our concerns. We can apply to the courts, then we can change and solve the issue. These are the issues from our side. And what needs to be done from the human uh, for the human rights situation in Turkey? It is simple. There are problems which are directly related to the Kurdish issue in this country. So there is need for peace process in this country with no further delay. If the peace talks begin, it will not be the end of the problems. It will be the beginning of the solution to problems in this country. I mean, when I say problems, it is related to the economic life, it is related to social life, it is related to the cultural life, political life, etc. So peace talks, peace process will not be the end of problems, will be the beginning of the solution. That is very important. Then there is need for a new constitution which respects diversity, plurality in this country, because this is the fact. According to our, I mean, in this country, we are talking about more than 20 different ethnic and religious groups. It is a fact. However, the constitution says there is one nation, one language. Huh? One nation, one language. If the founding document, the constitution, does not recognize you, does not recognize your rights, how come you can expect, how come you can expect a perfect situation, an ideal situation in other documents? I mean, the secondary legislation, etc. How come you can expect an, an ideal practice and implementation in your daily life, in the public service? So there is need for a, change, a new constitution based on human rights principles as well. And there is need for a change in mentality of the public authorities to improve the human rights situation in the country. When I say the mentality change, I mean public authorities should respect rights for everyone. This is the key issue because the Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights begins as follows. Everyone is equal in terms of human rights and dignity. This is our motto for as well. We say human rights are for everyone huh? in our association. So it is, it is, I mean, I may not go into details because of the limited time, but if legislation respects human rights, then there will be a better implementation of this legislation. Then there will be an effective judicial mechanism if you have any problem related to your rights and freedoms, then you can go to court. And if legislation protects your rights, then you will have a solution. Because you, we may have such crazy guys, crazy public officers in any part of the world. The solution is, for such crazy people, is a judicial investigation and effective judicial protection. Solidarity is, what does it mean to me and to human rights defenders under such difficult conditions? Solidarity is not an abstract concept. It is a key instrument that we have because comparing to public authorities or violators' capacity, we as human rights defenders, we have lesser capacity because in terms of financial issues, in terms of human resources, in terms of mm, media capacity, media power, we are in a weaker position. There is an orchestrated policy for the violators. There is a legislation which says you can put this person into prison if there is any criticism. There is an security officer, for example, who can easily arrest you or who can easily beat you in the street if you uh, use your rights for freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. And there is the media. They are so strong. 
but they don't have this solidarity, which means they don't come together for a person whom they don't know. And they don't take any actions, they don't take initiatives for a person whom they haven't seen yeah. in their personal life. So the solidarity means in my personal life, when I was arrested, I was taken, I was, my house was raided at six in the morning and I was taken to the police department at nine or 10 in the morning. And the first statement which criticizes my arrests together with other human rights defenders was issued at 8.30. Okay. This is very important. I was put into prison because at that time, the perpetrators wanted to silence me. Yeah? But my colleagues within the country and outside the country became my voice. They came together, they raised their concerns about the judicial harassment of me and other human rights defenders. So they became my voice. It is very important. When I was arrested, some of my colleagues came together and exercised this freedom of assembly because I was arrested. When I was arrested, the perpetrators wanted to keep me in a position, in a passive position, but they came together. They organized activities. So solidarity is very, very important. It is not only a word. It is not only sending a letter. When you send a letter, you keep, I mean, you make contributions to your colleagues to keep his or her spirit high. It is very important. And when I, and while I was in prison, I received several books for my PhD study, for example, from different parts of the world for nothing. And I received some books from people whom I haven't seen in my personal life. And when I was released, I tried to read some of these people and I couldn't reach because we had no connections. And they took some actions. They stood with me. It is very, very important. So this word solidarity is very important, is the substantial part of our activities because we take actions for a person whom we think that he or she is right and who is subjected to violations. That is very important. Solidarity is the key issue in my personal life. This is the motivation in my personal human rights struggle. And this is how I can still continue in this human rights movement. Otherwise, I could have easily stopped after such huge and grave repression and pressure in my personal life. I mean, I was in prison, I was held in prison for one year for my human rights activities. I didn't see my daughter. Huh? I didn't see my wife. My, family, my mom and my dad, for one year, so it is too much. But I was able to back to the human rights struggle because of the solidarity, thanks to solidarity. It is, it is very, very important. Yes. I am absolutely optimistic <laughs> for the future because tomorrow will be better than today. Today is better than yesterday. Of course, there are fluctuations in our personal life. We may face difficult periods, but in the long run, it is always better. It is always brighter because, for example, I'm, sometimes I'm making jokes in the executive committee. I mean, I'm in charge of operations and I'm in charge of the meetings that we have regularly. And I say, 33 years ago, when 98, Human, human rights defenders founded this association, I was not there. I'm here now. That means we must be optimistic huh? because if I had been there, there would be 99 founders, not 98. So I'm here and there will be people after me for sure because this is how the process occurs. This is what happens in our organization. In the course of these 33 years of the Human Rights Association, we had maybe more than 100 people, maybe more than 100 people who joined this association. And we are not the only association for human rights. There are several other organizations. 
how come I cannot be optimistic? That's the one thing, that's for sure. And despite all this pressure, for example, for the academics for peace, we are still defending and we are still supporting this statement. We will not be a party to this crime. This is very important. Most of the academics didn't take a step back. It is very important and it is the key reason for me to be optimistic and it is the key reason for the hope for my future. This is one thing. And as for the other violations, like, for example, the elections. In the elections, despite all one-sided propaganda, majority of the society still voted for their political parties that they think that it will be a solution. That means, despite all these pressures, despite all these violations, at least half of the society, it would be different if there had been no pressure, of course, despite all these pressures, still 50% of the society says no to these repressive policies. This is why I am optimistic. Yeah. This is why I am hopeful for the future. Of course, we had lost our friends under such difficult periods. I mean, we were in prison and we were lucky comparing to our colleagues. For example, the last murder case happened in November 2015 when Tai Elchi, our member, and the, bar, the then president of the Bar Association in Diyarbakir, he was murdered while he was criticizing the policies, violent policies in his province. So this is, of course, it worries us when we see one of our friends is killed or he is in prison. Currently, we have several members in prison. I have, I mean, Human Rights Association has members in prison. It is not making us happy, but we are doing our best to make them free. And when they are free, we will be so stronger. So we are optimistic. I mean, being a human rights defender means we should be optimistic. And I am an absolute optimistic person in my personal life. Sometimes my colleagues, and including my wife, say, are you living in the same world with us? Why are you so optimistic? Yeah. I'm saying this is the only way for me to be optimistic because I really believe it, one thing. The other thing is I need to motivate my colleagues. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to create any depression among my colleagues and activists in the society. So we should be optimistic. That is one thing. Even if we are not optimistic in a certain period of the day, week or year, it may happen. I mean, it happens to me as well. At that time, I try to remain silent. I don't want to express my negative opinions if I'm not so optimistic. But I'm always optimistic, let me say.